So welcome to this uh, GDI podcast. I'm uh, Richard Heeks. I'm a chair in digital development at the Institute and I'm with Basma Albana. Who used to be a student at, at GDI, the Center for Digital Development. Um, so Basma, uh, we worked uh, together on your PhD, but uh, can you explain a little bit about um, your PhD research and what initially attracted you to work on this idea of data-powered positive deviance? Okay, so my, my PhD research was on developing a methodology that uses digital data, such as remote sensing data and mobile data, to identify outliers who succeed against odds. And um, the point is to try to uncover their underlying practices and strategies and trying to scale them within their communities. And it's an idea that was based on a, or is based on a development approach, which is called the positive deviance approach. Um, that was developed by the Sternans in the 1990s. But the thing is that they used to do this identification of outliers using more traditional data, such as interviews and surveys. And, and um, the, the, the innovation in my research was mainly into looking into digital data sources that are being increasingly available and trying to um, capitalize on them to identify those outliers or outperformers. And the first time I, I, I learned about this concept was one year before applying for my PhD. So I was taking a course on design thinking. And there I, uh, one of the examples that were, that were used was on the positive deviance approach. And at that time, I, I thought to myself that this concept is very intriguing and how I haven't heard about it before. And what, what's really interesting about it is that it's different than the standard model of development where you, instead of looking for failures, you look for success. And instead of relying on external expertise, you're building on local wisdom and know-how. And uh, the following year, when I was applying for my PhD and I wanted to do something in, in data science and, and development, um, I couldn't help but remember the concept of positive deviance and how the, the, the analogy between the outliers in the positive deviance approach and the outliers in statistics or in data science. And, and that's why I thought, why not merge? Okay, yeah, no, that's great. So you've talked quite a bit about, about outliers and development, about the Sternin's work. Um, maybe could you give us an example, maybe start with an example of the traditional approach to positive deviance and, and an example of what an outlier would, would represent? Okay, so um, one example is the very famous story in, of Vietnam, which mm -hmm. is uh, that uh, when Sternin was at that time um, heading the Save the Children Foundation in Vietnam, and he was asked to solve the problem of malnutrition. And instead of going for the supplemental feeding programs, he, he came across um, this concept of positive deviance, which is looking into the ones who are doing better and trying to understand what are the uncommon strategies and practices that they're doing mm. and using it in, uh, as the starting point for looking for solutions. And he did that in Vietnam. He looked for extremely poor villages that had well-nourished children. And by doing so, he was able to identify some of those villages. And he went there, he did some ethnography and qualitative research, and he found out that there are few families that had those well-nourished children. And what they did is that mothers did very simple things, such as adding sweet potato tops and shrimps at the rice patties to their children's meal or uh, having more frequent meals than, 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 than fewer meals over the day mm -hmm. and washing their children's hand more frequently. And by scaling those simple, extremely simple practices, he was able to reduce and rehabilitate an estimated of 80,000 um, uh, children and um, uh, was able also to reduce malnutrition rate drastically. And by from, from that, he started thinking, why not making it uh, um, a tool that can be used in, in, in development? And it's an asset-based approach tool. And he, he used it to, he used it in other uh, domains and other applications to, to scale the method. So can you give a couple of other examples of other development challenges or development problems that the positive deviance approach has been applied to? 
um, the Positivist approach was applied in um, child uh, in in um, in female genital um, FGM in Egypt. Mm. It was also applied in retaining in school retention. Uh, it was applied in agriculture to identify farmers who are having higher agricultural productivity, um, in reducing infections at hospitals. So those are examples of how it has been applied uh, previously. So that last example, they'd be they'd be finding out hospitals with much lower infection rates than peer hospitals or similar hospitals, yes. and then going in and investigating how Which it was, one? what were the factors that underlay the fact that they had much lower infection rates, and then trying to scale those out to other hospitals exactly. in order to reduce infections more generally. Exactly. Okay, that's fine, I get it. So that sounds like um, a very valuable development technique. So what were some of the issues that you were identifying with positive deviance that made you think, well, maybe big data or other digital data sources might offer something additional or better than what's being done in the traditional positive deviance approach? Um, the main issue was that uh, when you're relying on traditional data and primary data collection, there are limitations to the sample size because the cost and the time is directly proportional to the sample size. Mm. So um, uh, so w in, in the traditional approach, you are looking into sm a small population and within the small population, you're trying to look for outliers. And this reduces the number of outliers that you can identify because me normally there are around from two to 10%. Mm -hmm. And when you have a small sample, it's very hard to generalize their strategies and practices on larger population. So the, 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 there was a limitation on the sample size that they can take due to the, to the time and cost constraints. And also, um, there are other th there there are other issues like risk of, of of going to places where it's unsafe to do this kind of uh, qualitative inquiry, and um, again the problem of trying to scale those practices to larger populations so that they can inform policy and community interventions. Um, so that's for the main challenges when it comes to the positive deviance approach, and and that was the point where. Um, I thought to myself, how about using digital data that is available, yeah. uh, increasingly available, and using this data, readily available data, to identify those outliers at, at a larger population with very little initial time and, uh, and cost. Mm. And those outliers or positive deviants will be the entry points for the qualitative inquiry, which is the expensive part. Mm. But you will have larger samples of those kind of outliers. Yeah. So I guess, I mean, think about it. If you were doing something with hospitals, maybe with traditional field work where you have to go in and you have to interview a lot of people in each hospital, maybe you might have, I don't know, at best, a few dozen hospitals. Mm. Whereas I guess the big data sets, maybe they contain details about hundreds or thousands of, of hospitals or whatever the other units of analysis there might be. And therefore you're going to have a much greater set of data to be working on. And as you said, going to have much greater number of, in absolute terms, a much greater number of outliers that you can look at and analyse the factors. And instead of it being maybe just a small handful of outliers, hospitals that maybe they have some exceptional features about them, you can't generalise, you're going to have maybe again dozens or even hundreds of these positive deviants. And then when you look at them, you're really going to be able to generalize from those then their, their features. Okay, that's that that's clear. So you've had this idea essentially, all right, positive deviance is a great thing in development, but there are some challenges around time and, and risk and the sample sizes and so on. And big data might might help. So so kind of what was your next step with having had this nice idea, this potentially great idea, what, what was your next step in taking that forwards with your PhD research? So the next step was to look for cons like viable case studies uh, that where I can test uh, the method mm. and test the viability of those data sources for application. And um, uh, initially I wanted to try the, the three main data sets mm -hmm. that are very known in their use in big data for development. So I wanted to try remote sensing data, online data, and mobile data. Mm -hmm. But somewhere in the middle of the PhD, I realized that the mobile data is extremely challenging to actually access the data. So I limited my initial research at the very beginning to online and mobile data, uh, online and remote sensing data, sorry. And um, 
to give you an example of the kind of cases that I that I worked on, so uh, the first case that I worked on was on um, researchers in information systems, Egyptian researchers in the information systems field that are having publication outperformance when uh, compared to their peers. Mm. And for that, I used online readily available data such as Google Scholar data and and other data and online digital data sets to identify those using their uh, citation matrices such as H index and HI index and, and, and stuff like that. And after identifying them using those digital data, I had to do a field work in Egypt to and interviewed the outlier researchers to uncover some of their practices and strategies. So that was the, the, the first case that I worked on. And then- let, me, let me just, I mean, picking up on one of those things, because you'd all already mentioned it. I mean, a couple of things to bring out of that. First is data for development has a great deal of promise, mm. but when you're actually going out there, it can be quite a challenge to find the data sets accessibility, data quality, all of these things are actually, um, you know, can be quite serious challenges. And the other thing you identified is you've, you've gone in hoping that this might be a sort of cheaper, quicker way of, of doing positive deviance. But actually, from if I understand correctly from what you're saying, you can do that for identifying the positive deviance. But then actually, it turns out you have to kind of generally, at the moment, at least, get in on the ground and still go and talk to them yes. in order to find the, the the factors that are underlying their positive performance. Is that right? Yes, yes. So the digital data can only tell you what is happening, like yeah. the what, yeah. but it wouldn't be able to explain the how and the why. Yeah. And that's the part where you would need what we call thick data, which is data collected through qualitative um, approaches and ethnography. But, but the beauty of this um, method is that it provides a systematic way to actually integrate those two types of data. And this was something that missing that was missing in the data for development practice, finding those kind of ways to actually complement those two different types of data. Because I strongly believe that big data, the value from big data cannot be actually um, obtained mm. unless it's complemented with traditional data. So it's not supposed to substitute it. It's supposed to just complement it. But um, as you mentioned, Richard, there were a lot of challenges when it comes to accessing such data. But once you're able to access it, you can start to gain the, the value of using it, which is identifying them at large scale and over long periods of time. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the, the, so you're not only able to identify deviance at large scale, but you can also identify deviance over time. And this was something that's very hard to actually achieve with traditional data because you would need like prospective studies. And so, so it was also one of the, uh, and I mean, I, I don't know whether that was the case with the, with the researchers. So just thinking about sort of development challenges, mm -hmm. looking at the researchers, one of the key challenges in research has been that there are biases or there are various other contextual factors, which means that research in the global south doesn't really get the profile that it that it might otherwise get. And what you're looking at is helping to understand, well, how is it that some researchers in the global south are able to get that profile and citations and impact for their for their research? In terms of that longitudinal picture of positive deviance, it, are there put some particular examples of that you came across in your work of how that might be uh, useful in addressing development challenges that couldn't otherwise be addressed, or that was that something for the future, if you like, rather than for the particular cases that you looked at? Um, it it was important in in, in identifying or in uh, this kind of longitudinal coverage coverage was extremely important in other cases mm -hmm. um, that I've worked on uh, as part of a of a global collaborative that I was part of um, and um, just to give you an example so in one of the case studies that we were looking on what we're looking into we were looking into um, uh, rangelands and communities in Somalia that are able to preserve their rangelands despite frequent droughts. And um, the, 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 the hardest drought and the, 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 the most climatic stress that they, were, they, were, they experienced was in 2016 and 2017. And in the analysis of the remote sensing data, we had to track the health 
of the rangelands from 2016 and 2017 until 2020, mm -hmm. and based on it, deviance was identified. So our baseline was the rangelands before the drought, yeah. and and based on it, we were able to identify the rangelands that are uh, having an, an enhanced vegetation health despite what they witnessed in 2016 and 2017. Something like this would ha wouldn't have been possible if it weren't for the remote sensing data that was able to cover this period of time. A similar case was in Ecuador when we looked into deforestation rates and we wanted to see the deforestation rates in the fa past five years because if, if I'm not looking over a long period of time, they might not be deforesting this year, but they already finished all the forest in, in the past five years. So here we were also looking into rates of, of deforestation over a period of time. Yeah. So those are those are two good examples of where this new approach is enabling you to get insights into understanding outperformers in terms of these were cattle pastures. Is that yes, right? yes, cattle yeah. ranchers. Who were preserving their, their lands and in Ecuador equally, that was cattle farmers as well. Wasn't yes. It? So those were cattle farmers in Ecuador and, and pastoralists and in Somalia. Yeah, okay. And we should also mention as well, you talked about this global collaboration, that this was involving um, GIZ, particularly the data lab and the field offices, and UNDP Accelerator Labs, also I think Global Pulse yes. Lab Jakarta, but particularly the, it was GIZ, I think, who read an article, a paper that you, you published, it's kind of every PhD student's dream, yes. uh, read your literature review, uh, were really taken by it and funded a, a was it a one and a half million euro project as a result, which scaled out your ideas to uh, I think six or seven different projects. A couple of which uh, the Ecuador one and the uh, Somalia one you've uh, you've mentioned. So yeah. you've kind of got to this wonderful stage that you you're doing your own PhD research, but alongside this is this big global project that's that's putting your ideas into into practice and where are we kind of up to at the moment with with all of those 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 projects or what what came out of of all of those projects that were funded by GIZ and UNDP so um there were four um main projects that were somehow co-funded co-funded between the UNDP accelerator labs and GIZ data lab mm. uh one in Somalia Ecuador um Niger and um uh Mexico, Mexico. <laughs> And uh, in those four projects, um, we're currently in the post field work stage. Mm. Um, some of them um, went to the stage where they identified those uncommon practices and strategies, and now they're engaging with different stakeholders to inform uh, some maybe policy or community interventions. And um, maybe I can give you an example of some of the, yeah, sure. the, 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 the findings from some of the interesting projects. So um, in the Niger project, um, we were looking into um, crop productivity. Farmers were able to achieve better crop productivity um, um, and, 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 and mainly in um, um, Mille and Sergam. So cereal crops. And we were able to identify some of the communities that are achieving better using remote sensing data. Uh, and um, after going there, we were able to identify some findings such as leaving their melee stalks and stems on the ground, which helped reduce uh, um, so, uh, the, the effects of wind ero erosion and also to help restore the soil organic matter. They also left um, the gao trees, um, which increased soil fertility. There was this notion of useful rain that was common ac across some of those farmers, which is you don't have you don't sow unless the height of the water is forty millimeters. Mm -hmm. And um, they also used uh, um, a technique which is called the zai techniques, which also um, enabled um, soil regeneration and uh, reducing surface water runoff. So, so those were some of the findings that we found in Niger. And now uh, we'll, we're, we're uh, thinking of how to engage with a GIZ project there mm. to somehow make use of those kind of findings. Okay. So you've, so you've kind of, you've identified the positive deviance. Mm. You've been able through field work to identify the, the factors or the behaviours that underlie that positive deviance across a range of these, these projects and, and now moving to the next stage of scaling those out. 
um, through local actors. What about more, more generally for the overall project of, of DPPD, the data powered positive deviance? What what kind of what do you see as the, the next stages or the next steps for that beyond those those pilot projects uh, that you mentioned? So the, the, the initiative and its current form have changed a little bit. So after working with the UNDP Accelerator Labs and the GIZ projects on, on those different pilots, uh, we're now at a point where it's more of an individual effort. So I'm working now on consulting in DPPD along with uh, um, another colleague, um, Andy, uh, who has been working with me on this. And we're trying to pick up on some consultancy work and training that is related to DPPD. I'm working on a project in India uh, to identify uh, communities that are adopting uh, a crop uh, drought resilient, uh, sorry, heat resilient crops. So in India, there's the problem of the terminal heat at the end of the season. Um, an organization such as Simit introduced early sown wheat, and we're trying to see who are adopting this kind of innovation and why, why there is better adoption. And another thing that is coming uh, um, at the end of this year is that we're trying to develop a course on DPPD specifically in climate change mitigation and adaptation. So this is the work that we're currently working on um, in terms of uh the DPPD. Yeah, and I was going to I was going to say drawing that out. You can see that quite a number of the the projects there, deforestation um, in in Ecuador, the rangelands, Niger, of course, is a very climate uh, challenge location, and now the Indian project as well. There's quite a concentration of activity that DPPD can be applied to environmental and climate change related development challenges. But I think you've also shown how it can go broader than that as well, haven't you? Because Mexico was looking for safer areas for women uh, yes. who are more protected from gender-based violence when moving around, uh, moving around in the city. And I think was there also a project around financial governance in North Macedonia that was uh, that was mooted certainly as well. So at least that's showing that it's not just around farming and agriculture and climate change and so on. There's quite a range of different areas and different development challenges that the DPPD approach can be applied to. I'm hoping that there's going to be a link somewhere at the end of the, of the podcast, but um, more generally, if people are interested in finding out more about DPPD, what should they do? They can check the website that we have, so datapoweredpd.org. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. um, and there we have um, a number of resources to this. So there are the articles, the blog posts, the, the reports, a handbook, which they can start with, which is a great resource, which are showing, which is showing the different steps and stages of applying DPPD along with very valuable tools. And of course they can get in touch. So there's my email and, and um, I'm looking forward to see more ad adopters. We all are. DPPD was a great idea, wonderful project, you know, that from just a small seed of your own idea some years ago, it blossomed into not only a PhD for you, but a big global research project and hopefully um, a really exciting new approach in development. So Basma, thanks very much for being in conversation with me. Thank you, Richard, and thanks for all the support in the past four years. No problem.